So yeah, lesson, ooh, lesson 50. So we started Hard way belief. back, John chapter 1, if you remember those days, and working our way through <laughs> G, the pre-ministry years, and then his early ministry with the early chapters in John, and then the Galilean ministry with uh, the parables and the Sermon on the Mount, and then this change in pace where he went out to Gentile regions and it was in a Gentile excuse me Gentile region that um, Peter made his famous confession and then right after that we have the transfiguration and then um, kind of with that he he makes this starts making more uh, announcements that he is he has a mission and it's not a mission the disciples are necessarily excited about and it's to go to, to Jerusalem to sacrifice himself and so we're in that last six months of his of uh, his ministry right before um, we get to the final week, and um, so we're in. He's he's left the Galilee and he's in uh, Judea. So he's kind of moving. Even even the text is is kind of moving us into uh, into drawing us into Jerusalem. So we're in uh, we did a lot of chapters in uh, John recently, and we're now switching to Luke for a little bit, and then we'll get back to to John. And ultimately, we're coming up on on the the final week and don't think that's going to be short there's a lot in the final week almost half the book of john is all about um what the happens on sunday and after yeah. so got, got a lot to, a lot of ground to cover okay well let's go ahead and get going um somebody want to read luke 11 verse 1 i knew i could walk straight to bobby I knew he was ready. <laughs> <laughs> now it came to pass as he was praying in a certain place that one of his disciples said to him Lord, teach us to pray as John also taught his disciples. So here's kind of a throwback to John the Baptist here. And uh, if you're not watching Chris's background videos, you're kind of robbing some of the context here. But, um, you know, in that day, right, Chris, the rabbis all had... Yes. You want to explain that? So they had um, common prayers that they uh, recited, and then apparently what we think was happened was each uh, rabbi would teach his disciples a, a specific, like a signature, almost almost like we say in Jesus' name, uh, and that means we're done with the prayer. And in this case, the, the the disciples' prayer, the Lord's prayer, or the Our Father might be that that closing. We're also going to see that in as we move in this chapter that the, this is not to say that every prayer has to be. Um, standardized because he's going to talk about bringing your petition and in fact for um, Protestants it's more the other way we're comfortable with spontaneous prayer we're less comfortable with written out um, prayers that we just repeat and actually both are good uh, and I think that's, that might be a lesson here so um, I just said that we're out of Galilee and we're in um, in Judea and yet this passage is Matthew has this passage happening in Galilee and it has it happening in the Sermon on the Mount, which we everyone knows was uh, in around the Sea of Galilee. So what's going on here? Um, scholars have a lot of debate on this. We aren't really sure. Uh, it does say one of his disciples. So would this be a new disciple who wasn't there in Galilee and is now asking the same question that they asked previously and Jesus is giving the same answer? That seems to be um, the, the, a plausible explanation. Um, but this, even the content of what we call the Lord's Prayer in Luke is very much truncated from Matthew. So there's just some differences here. Um, you know, McGee kind of points out that all the servants of God have been men of prayer. And it kind of made me think of James. You know, James, some of you probably remember, any of y'all know James's nickname? There you go. Camel Knee. That's right. So he prayed so much that his knees were naughty and big and ugly because he spent so much time on his knee. You know, and Martin Luther had a great quote, and y'all can look it up, but it was something like, you know, Lord, I've got to do all of this stuff today. My list is so long of things I've got to accomplish today. So for that reason, I'm going to get up at three and make sure I pray for seven hours before I start my day. What a concept, right? So <clears throat> the prayer is the most part that we sometimes, if you're like me, we kind of don't put as much right. effort into the prayer as we do the effort part when mm -hmm. we kind of have the cart before the horse. Go ahead. So um, we'll get into this a little bit later, but we've both read a very challenging book on how to pray more effectively and it even has the bold claim how to get 100% of your prayers answered, and we're thinking, well, it's some shortcut. What is this? Let me read it. That's not the author's point at all. Um, the author's point is prayer is not 
are bringing our wish list to him. I mean, it is, but it's not only that. It's prayer is, I want to be God. I want to be on your page. I want to be following you. So I want to be praying what your will is. And then the author says, if you do that, then 100% of your prayers will be answered. And you go, oh, okay. Um, but it's, it's a fantastic book. It's called Secrets of a Prayer Warrior by Derek Prince. Not that not that uh, long to read, but very, very challenging. Yeah. I so the recommend. first question here is, how can we pray? Can we be like this disciple and, and say, teach me to pray? How can I pray? How can I, how can I be a closer follower of you? And the next question for you to think about maybe in your quiet time is, you know, is prayer your first thought or your last thought? So a lot of the problems that we have, putting myself here, <laughs> is because I prayed about it after I did it, right? Instead of inviting the Lord in first, right? It's like, hey, God, rescue me from my bad choice. Instead of, uh, God, I need some help because I'm about to make this choice and I don't want to make the wrong one. Those are two different things. And if we get it in the proper order, our life is going to go a lot better. And uh, kind of like what Chris said, it's not that you have to change your perspective. It's not that you don't come with your requests. It's that once you understand how good God is, you know that his decision for your life is better than the one you're going to make. So your desires are his desires. And once you get there and you align that, that's where the joy is. Yeah, and I think on, on the surface that sounds like something that's just impossible to do, but that then the, this book kind of goes in. No, it's not that hard. It's just, it just takes some, you know, it takes a different mindset, a different change. Okay, let's read two through four. So he said to them, When you pray, say, Our Father in heaven, how would be your name? Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us day by day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Lynn, did you have some? Yeah, I just, uh, I was gonna, I just noticed here that it says that uh, Jesus was praying in a certain place. So they saw him, and they wanted to follow his example. Yeah. And that's how we should, you know, we, we should be an example to others, our family, and our, you know, people, co-workers, friends, neighbors. When they see us praying, maybe mm -hmm. they would gain a hunger to pray. So if you compare this to um, Matthew's version, it's, it's a lot shorter. Um, I, I came across something curious, and it's it's not that this is what I'm about to say is a big issue because it's really not, but it's illustrative on we need to be Bereans. Um, this famous commentator who has a study Bible uh, said, when Jesus said our Father, that was something new, and that was they they that was too familiar for for Jewish people to say. They would never say our Father, and then it's like a little bit of Google search would have said that that's not true at all. Um, there was a famous prayer that's in, in the Jewish liturgy that goes, Avinu Malkeinu, Avinu Malkeinu, our father, our king, our father, our king. And so they were very comfortable saying our father. And so it's just not that that's a big deal, but it's like, okay, now that's in a study Bible. Now that's in a Bible that's printed and, you know, millions of people are reading it. And, you know, which, if we just need to be, be Bereans, right? Don't believe what I say. Don't, don't believe what a commentator says without checking it out. So it's just kind of a small reminder. Chip, question? Okay, let's let's talk about this for a second. Um, let's start with our Father. You know, when we go, we go all the way back to Matthew six, he said this in a big crowd, and he's repeating it now to the small crowd. But understand that the big crowd. They weren't all believers at that time. They weren't all disciples. So kind of like when I told about my praise story, you know, we need to look at everybody. Jesus is our father, right? Now, some of them may be wayward at the moment, right? Or prodigals, but he's all our father. And if you look at it from that lens, then you might be less judgmental, less you might have more heart for the person, less division, less other thing. And then hallowed back be his name. How many of y'all saw the opening of the Olympic? Do you think that we hallow his name? And as a country and as a nation, did we hallow his name? Did we defend? Who defended Jesus publicly? Right. Iran. <laughs> he sent a letter to France, right? Defending the prophet Jesus. I mean, that to me was very convicting for us as a nation. Um, and I won't go on and on, but let, let me just close with this. Your kingdom come. So I'm going to ask you a question. What hedge word is in there that Jesus said? Because Jesus said this, like, your kingdom come. This is the same guy that, that spoke and Lazarus came out of the grave. And he said, your kingdom come. Now, did he say thousands of years later or, 
you know, all these other things? Are there any hedge words in there? Or your kingdom come, if it's your will? Or, you know, was there any hedge words there? He said, my kingdom is here. He said, your kingdom come, right? Do we really think like that? Do we, do we, do you, do you operate that way? Like his kingdom is here. It's now, it's available, right? Because we're, we're on the other side of the cross. Praise Jesus, right? Think about all those Old Testament saints that would love to trade places with you and have the Holy Spirit right here inside of us instead of in some temple that they had to go to. We're on this side. So the words like kingdom come and seeing Jesus declare that and say that, that should change everything. Yeah. Life Application Commentary said, while it is a petition for evil to be destroyed and for God to establish a new heaven and earth, it is also to pray that more and more people will enter the kingdom, mm -hmm. so the kingdom that exists here and now. And so that is, uh, so when we say your kingdom come, it's like what kind of, we have a role to play in that. We have God, God to use it to bring the kingdom here, um, to bring that peace and that rest and that comfort to to this, uh, this dark world. There is, um, just a couple of, you know, kind of style points uh, to make. When you pray, give praise first and then follow up with your petitions, which is what we do uh, when we start. Um, so he, he starts with praising God and then, um, then asks for the daily bread. The other thing I noticed, and I just said this to Josh as he left here, notice the pronouns. They're not my and I, they're our. Forgive us our sins. Give us our daily bread you know and so we're in this room and all of our worship songs are like just between me and god as if no one else is in the room with us so how about if we say you know if we changed the lyrics of the song and i'm already blanking what the song was but um to you know our you know make make it our because we're in a community together and so i said what what is the lesson for us that the pronouns are us and our in this prayer instead of me and mine something to think about because it's like we are so that culture was such a, a you know they were bound by the community and some of the things that we read that look a little harsh well you 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 get you know you wipe out the whole town well it's because the whole town was tolerating it in that day it wasn't just there wasn't any you know private sin was very um very limited if, if someone was sinning, everyone else knew about it. It's like living in a small town. And so if, they're li if they know about it and the sin is still going on, then, then kind of by extension, they're condoning it. So that's some of the thoughts there. Okay, five through eight. Who'd like to read? And he said to them, which of you shall have a friend and go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has come to me on his journey and I have nothing set before him. And he will answer Sorry. from within and say, do not trouble me. The door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give it to you. I say to you, though he will not rise and give to him because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence, he will rise and give him as many as he needs. So we're going to go to Israel one of these days, and we're going to see the first century house, and, and we're going to read a, a parable like this, and we're going to, oh, yeah. Because in, in a one-room house that's in kind of a surrounding a courtyard and everyone, every family has their own dwelling, it's just a one-room house and everyone's sleeping, you know, their beds and cots on the floor. And like, oh, this parables like this will just come to life. And that's, that's what's one thing, one of the many things that's really cool about going to Israel. Um, Luke has this style of uh, parable, and, and Matthew does too a little, bit, in a little bit, where he presents something disagreeable and then as he's, he's comparing that to God. It's called the light to heavy um, or how much more. In fact, in the next parable, it'll say, if you being evil, how much more is your father good? So it's not that God is like this grumpy neighbor or God is like, in another parable, it's the unjust judge and the persistent widow. It's that we're to be persistent and how much more is God ready, willing, and able to to answer our prayers than even a, a human would be? Yeah, and just just understand that hospitality, especially in the yeah. Old Testament, and it's kind of a shame that our culture has lost that. But hospitality then was huge. All we have to do is, I, I believe it was in Hebrews, but um, you know, one of the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah was yeah. hospitality. Like that was one of the ones that got their punishment because the angels came and they were not. Suitable, right? So when you look at how the God looks at hospitality here, you know, and, and Chris covered this in the background video, but it's kind of shocking to our ears. But remember, when we study the word, we need to understand the culture, the setting, the audience and all that. Then once we understand that, then we can better apply it 
to our situation, right? So in this situation, in this culture, it would have been a shocking thing for someone to show up at three in the morning and you not have food for them. Like that would have been a total dishonor thing and that would have spread through throughout, you know, land. It'd be like, if people showed up at our house at three in the morning and we didn't feed them because we hadn't been to Sam's and then y'all find out at the church, oh my God, the Lees didn't have any food and they came over all the way from DC and they had to go to bed hungry, you know, and you'd be going, oh my gosh, we may have to kick them out of church. You know, that, I mean, that's, that's how it would have been back then. There was a ton of pressure that there was just, there's almost no excuse for no hospitality, you know, and With this being said, the audience at the time was probably more shook that the guy wouldn't get up and save his neighbor. From their perspective, the neighbor's house is on fire if he can't help somebody in need. Yeah, and it's, it's clear with the next parable, we're talking about, you know, the when you ask for uh, you know, an egg and get a scorpion, right? That's, that's, that's clearly, you know, offensive to even to us, but... This parable is every bit as offensive as that one is. It's like not, not, not offensive, shocking, surprising. It's that twist that Jesus adds to it um, that, that really got their attention. Which So he gets their attention and then he, he makes the point, um, which, which we'll get to. So the, the, the homework on this one is, do you pray with audacity and shamelessness? Like this guy went to his neighbor's house at three in the morning because he was desperate, right? Knocking on that door at three in the morning, making sure that he could provide. So what are you doing? Are you shameless when it comes to that? And then the second is, you know, I mean, we kind of applied our intercessory prayer here. We're trying to apply it each Wednesday night, but you need to think about this when you're doing your intercessory prayer, right? Because the word is clear that, you know, if two or more are gathered in my name and they ask something through the Son, that glorifies the Father, then I will answer. So we need to stand on those promises and we're getting the opportunity for two or more gathering all around this room every Wednesday night. And we want transformation. We want change. We want praise. We want to bring glory to God. We want to have a real encounter with Jesus so that we don't have people that have had this weak form of Christianity that are, it's like they're, they've already got their vaccination. They're immune to Christ now because they had some weak form of it that was all religion and no religion. Relationship, And we need to have those transformations so that we can provide them a real, authentic encounter with Jesus. Go ahead. Yeah, the NASB has shameless. Looks like the King James. The King James has persistence. None of those are like, they don't really capture it. It's like, it's a boldness. It's an audacity. I mean, I can be persistent, but, you know. I can be persistent in trying to hammer a nail that won't go in too. That's not necessarily good. This is this is, um, and then the Yiddish word is chutzpah, right? If that kind of that captures it, okay, chutzpah. Um, have chutzpah when you bring your request to God, um, and you know, be be audacious, be shameless in, in a good way. We don't we tend not to use shameless positively, but um, in this case, be be open and and uh, you know just. Be bold. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, 9 and 10. Good luck, Trey. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives, and he who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. If I pray to win the lottery, this verse says, I'll get it. Right? <laughs> Obviously, you haven't read the book, <laughs> The Secrets of a Prayer Warrior, right? So It's not his will for me to win the lottery? Exactly. The other thing that I would say, you know, kind of personally just changed my prayer life is um, God says no, okay? So the sooner we figure that out, the better, right? So, and he also says not yet, because sometimes if you're praying for something, even if it's in God's will, it may be out of order because his timing is perfect. So sometimes when I get stuck praying for something and I know it's the Lord's will, but it may not be his timing, then I'll like... I do like a timeout, a spiritual timeout, and I say, okay, Lord, what do I need to be praying for now? (laughs) You know, and I kind of listen, and then God will redirect me, right? And then I'll start praying for something different because something has to be done first. Kind of like when you're in college, you can't sign up for calculus, right, the first semester. You probably got to, if you're like me, fundamentals of math. 
than algebra you know, going up, right? So sometimes we have things out of order. And um, I don't know if that helps at all, but that's what I've experienced. Deuteronomy 4, 29. There, from there, you will seek the Lord your God. You will find him if you search for him with all your heart and with all your soul. Way back, the intention is God wants a heart that follows him, that pursues him, that chases after him. Um, and we see that beautiful picture of, of the, the father in the prodigal son story. That's, that's the picture of God chasing after us, but we're supposed to be like that as well, seeking after him. And um, don't, <laughs> don't let me get, we just pray, don't let me get too far behind you. You know, I don't want to get out in front of you, God, but I also don't want to get too far behind. I want to be right in your dust, which is the phrase we use. Okay, um, let's go on to 11 through 13. If a son asks for bread from any father among you, will he give him a stone? Or, he at, or if he asks for a fish, will he give him a serpent instead of a fish? Or if he asks for an egg, will he offer a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So just like it's, you know, it's ridiculous to think that you would give your child a stone or a poisonous <laughs> something. Um, this is how sometimes we think, well, gosh, I'm just not good enough to come to God's throne or I'm not, you know, it's Jesus is saying, no, your father wants to give you these things. Um, I'm, sometimes I think I'm not deserving of God's blessing, right? No, God God desires to to bless you in, in that. Yeah. yeah, well, a couple of things. First off, the way they made bread back then, it looked like a stone, right? So the visuals here that he's using is, is applicable. It doesn't look like a Wonder Bread loaf at the grocery store, right. I assure you. The bread was much different. It looked like a stone there. The other thing is, I, I think... You know, um, you know what what Chris said was quite on with the spirit. A lot of times, you know, we we need to kind of like Jesus. We have the salvation piece, which we have to be sure of. And once you're sure, then He's the door, and then we have the kingdom piece, right? And as you step into the kingdom piece here, and you want to get closer in your relationship and closer in your walk, then you have the spiritual battle that comes, right? And the spiritual battle will poke at you and say. You don't deserve a blessing. And he's going to look back and he's going to point at your old life before you were sin and raised again. But we need to be focused more on the new life. You need to you need to quickly point out to the enemy, that was the old me. You know, I, I'm so worthy Jesus went to the cross for me. So we need to get our framework right and then we'll be more successful. And, and the devil is really good at reminding us of all of our fault, right? Or is it just me? Maybe he just does it to me. So just like in the previous parable where you have the grumpy neighbor as a, a type of God, and that sounds really weird, here we actually have this phrase, how much more? And that's, that's why this group of parables uh, get to be called how much more parables because, how, you know, if, if even that grumpy neighbor will eventually yield and, and give, uh, you know, give aid and comfort, then how much more is Heavenly Father going, going to do these things? There's an interesting um, twist here when you compare the Matthew version, and I think we found different kind of takes on this. And not, not that they're contradictory, I just think they're, they're different angles on it. So, if you then, being evil, give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Heavenly Father, Luke says, give the Holy Spirit, or give Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? And Matthew just says, if you Da, 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 da. How much more will your father give good things to those who ask him? Luke is definitely taking the spiritual angle on this. In um, in that culture, Jewish culture, snakes and scorpions were just signs of evil. And we've talked about our, our medical, you know, the, the whole uh, at, at Pergamos, they had the, the snake and the Escalapian, and, and they used snakes for medical healing. And that symbol, symbolism is still around today. If you've ever seen a hot, uh, you know, a hot medical logo, um, to the Jewish mind, that, those were evil. And so, if you know if these if we're con contrasting these evil spirit kind of things we're going to contrast that with how much more will the holy spirit um will, will god give so god will overcome that with with, with good so he he's contrasting uh, just in case y'all are slow like me sometimes snakes and scorpions mean like evil spirits he's saying that there are evil spirits here and He's not offering evil spirits. He's offering the Holy Spirit. So how many of y'all know that we fight some evil spirits today, right? The application point here is, for me, is, you know, do we ask that we're filled more with that Holy Spirit to be better equipped for all these battles that we're doing daily, right? Mm -hmm. And then if you can ask for gifts, one of the ones that I'm not sure if you've asked for, but you should if you haven't, is righteousness. Because you can ask for righteousness because he gives that. It's clearly within his will. And the more of that you get, then the 
closer you'll get Mm -hmm. in your relationship. Now, he may ask you to give something up, too, right? That's not righteous when you ask for that, but but it will get you closer to the Lord. Uh And so we've got this kind of Luke is focusing on spiritual, Matthew is focusing on more uh, practical, but then you get in the helicopter and go up a little bit and like, okay, who's, who is Luke, right? What is his theme? He wrote another book. He wrote part two called Acts. And all the way back in Luke one, he lists the Holy Spirit. He says uh, to, to Mary, the Holy Spirit will, will come upon you. Um, when Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit. These are all in Luke chapter one, right? So he's got this thread and he's going to talk about the Holy Spirit here. And then in Acts, right, Holy Spirit, big time, right? Acts two is when the Holy Spirit falls on Jerusalem. Acts eight is when the Holy Spirit falls on Samaritans. And Acts 10 is when the Holy Spirit falls on Gentiles. And then everything, I mean, the, the book should really be called Acts of the Holy Spirit because that's, it, is, it is all about what the Spirit was doing um, post-resurrection in the church. And so Luke is kind of setting us up. He's, he's teeing his audience up for um, to be Holy Spirit-minded. You want to talk about the definite article? I thought that was kind of fascinating. Yeah. It's kind so, of nerdy, but so one we're, of, we're kind of nerdy. So okay, yeah. So this may be a little bit of a rabbit trail for some of y'all, but um, one of the uh, commentaries that I read went to the original Greek, and it indicated that here Luke says Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit. So there's, there's a bit of a debate. I don't know what the answer is. Obviously, if it's in your heart, it probably doesn't matter but th- there there are some thought that people say that you should say holy spirit versus the holy spirit because we don't call him the jesus right so um but anyway i thought that was interesting that it was pointed out here in the greek that the article is not there it's holy spirit yeah. right it emphasizes his person whereas when you put the the in front of it there's the thought that it de-emphasizes him being a person right and more of a yeah. yeah, more of an it, which I, th- I thought was an interesting thing. And it's kind of challenged me because when you when you try to say it, it, it sounds a little awkward, especially if you're like me. And, and I think that's why the, the translation brought them in so yeah. many times, you know, but but I can I can see the point. I'm not so sure whenever I would like is... it if y'all called me the Cody, right? <laughs> so <laughs> now, people have preferred pronouns. Is that your preferred yeah, definite yeah, article? Yeah, yeah. I think I could come up with more something more creative. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think we're uh, I think we're out of time. Though. Okay, we'll pick it up next time with uh, more. So Luke is going to he talked generally about prayer, and then he talked now specifically about prayer for um, spiritual power and spiritual authority. And now he's going to move in to a healing, um, casting out that spiritual authority. And there's going to be a whole discourse on that. So we'll get to that next week. Want to pray, sir? Pray, sir. Love to. Let's, let's pray together. Father, thank you for this uh, study we've had tonight. And we just thank you, God, you've called us to your throne. You've called us to to come persistently and boldly. And then we have this beautiful promise, Lord, that that you will answer. Uh, And may may we delight in you. uh, And we know that when we delight in you, you give us the desires of your heart. So help us that we may have hearts that wholly seek you. And, Lord, that uh, all of us would just be really uh, wonderfully challenged tonight to get on our knees and that our knees would would become rough like camel knees and that we would just be so diligent to fervently pray and come boldly before your throne. Lord, we thank you for your moving among us and we look forward to Sunday and what you desire to do there. We pray for revival and we pray for Holy Spirit awakening and may you just, uh, God, just continue to do great things as we call upon you. Lord, we love you and we praise you. We just pray this prayer.